Chris Brown, Steve Tafter with you and excited to announce that this season, every Tuesday, we are going to be joined by a familiar NFL analyst to many. If you're on social media, you see him use everything from his index finger to a ballpoint pen <laughs> to a spoon. I've even seen at times to point out things on various plays on film that he deciphers almost better than anybody in the business. It is ESPN NFL analyst Dan Orlovsky joining us. Dan, how are you, man? You got any new things you're going to use on your film clips this year? Like maybe a poker or something, something from the fireplace? Uh, what do you got on lined up here, man? Well, first off, I'm doing great, and it's great to be with you guys, not only now, but on every Tuesday, fired up for that. I, I don't have anything new that I plan on pointing with. I will say on <laughs> Thursday, uh, there is a new, I guess, like touch screen that we at ESPN are unveiling, specifically in the Ooh. Sports Center studio. So I'll be using that on more than likely Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's pretty sick. So it's a whole new studio that got built as well. So yeah. uh, nothing new, at least pointer wise, because I'm tall enough. Uh, <laughs> there's a little hint, but some people might be using some other stuff. So, yeah, right. So that, and that's really, uh, it's awesome because that's ha really how you got started in this bit. You went online, you said, listen, because you played quarterback for a long time, you, you rubbed up against some great players, you had a lot of snaps under your own belt. And, you went online and just started saying, listen, here's what they're doing. And you, you, yeah. you struck a nerve. People want to see somebody who, who knows what's going through the quarterback's mind. And you've gotten, been able to do some in-depth stuff. And, I, I, and let's just walk, talk about this opening weekend. I said a little bit ago, the potential is this. The Chiefs-Lions game could, in my opinion, could be an ugly game to start the season. But I think the best game of the weekend – is the last game Monday night, Bills-Jets. I think that is going to be an absolute heavyweight bout. What are your thoughts on this weekend and week one of the NFL's schedule? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, just speaking on Thursday night, I think it could be, you know, ugly as far as execution. The Chiefs usually aren't um, sloppy to start seasons because the way that they practice in training camp and Andy has those guys take so many preseason snaps. The, the, the most interesting part about this game for me, Steve, is this. Um, I, I think Detroit is going to line up with a top two or three offensive line and facing a defense that is without by far their best player, by far their best player, and say, stop it. Like, we, we dare you to try and figure out a way to stop this. And I think it's going to be, if you guys remember when the Raiders played the Chiefs, I think it was uh, last year the first time, and the, the Raiders ran the football down their throats with a fullback. I think we're going to see that a little bit out of Detroit. And I, if I was Detroit, I'd be preparing to see a ton of man coverage and a ton of movement on the defensive line. And the only reason why there's still a, are they really going to beat the Chiefs is because of Patrick. Um, but I think Detroit, before Chris was ever going to miss this game, I felt Detroit was going to give them hell, and I still feel that way. If their secondary, which is remade in Detroit, can play a little bit better than they did on the back end of last year, Detroit wins this game. Uh, but it, it's hard to bet against Patrick at home. I think Sunday night football is going to be massive, Giants versus Dallas. I think the Giants defense is going to, defense is going to be a problem because of their three guys up front, Dexter Lawrence, Dexter Lawrence Leonard Williams, and, and Thibodeau. Uh, in their secondary with the blitz packages. And then for Monday night, I, I, Monday night will take two of the top four or five rosters in the NFL and, and pit them against each other. And that's who the Bills and the Jets are. And it'll be interesting to see, okay, what's the, what's the Bills' defense without Vaughn? What's the offense with Kincaid? What's the Jets' defense um, with the addition of McDonald? And is the offensive line as bad as some people make it out to be? So – um, it, it's going to be awesome to watch those two teams go head to head. Yeah, your uh, your ESPN colleague Adam Schefter might have uh, put a put a different spin on the Chiefs Lions game. Apparently, Travis Kelsey hyperextended his knee in practice, and according to head coach Andy Reid, his status for Thursday is uncertain at this moment. That could change things precipitously. Um, but jumping back wow. to the Monday night game, Dan. Um, you know, you grew up in Connecticut, close enough to the New York metropolitan area to know how New York fans react when they think they have a winner on their hands. So without even getting into X's and O's on this question, let's strictly talk 
atmosphere. Yes, the Bills have been in road games before where it's loud. They've played in Arrowhead in the playoffs. MetLife Stadium has been loud when they've played there before. But with the hype that this team, the Jets, has come into the season with, Aaron Rodgers now on that roster, and Monday night atmosphere, the anniversary of 9-11. I mean, we're talking like fevered pitch that can border yeah. on intimidating for any experienced playoff type football team. Can you just lend some context to that, you know, having grown up in the New York metropolitan area? It'll be it'll be the biggest home game for the Jets, certainly in years and maybe, you know, decades. And when you walk around town, so I live, I live about 40 minutes from New York City. And the the town and the area that I'm in, it's pretty much split between Giants and Jets. We get a sprinkle of us down Patriots fans, but most of the area is Giants or Jets. For every one question I've had about the Giants, I've had 10 about the Jets. I've I've had 10 is Aaron Rodgers going to be that good? Are, are they really that good? Is Garrett Wilson as good as everyone says he is? Man, this offensive line stinks. Is the defense going to be the best defense in the NFL? And to know that, and this is why the NFL is the best, it's not like the Jets are playing on home, at home in this kind of time on the anniversary of 9-11 versus the Jaguars, not to be disrespectful, or the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're playing against a team that, for the last, what, three years has been one of the teams to beat in the conference that has one of the best quarterbacks in football, that has su- Super Bowl expectations, that has won the division two years in a row, I think, maybe three. So it, they, they brought in, you know, kind of one of the giants. That place will be nuts. How tough is it for a quarterback like Aaron to, I think it'll be less tough for Aaron to move from Green Bay into the same offense in a new team, new town, and certainly he's got to feel refurbished and re, 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 rejuvenated by what's going on in New York. How much of a, you know, like a settling in, or, or how long do you think it'll take him to jail? I think it may be uh, a little quicker because of yeah. Aaron Rodgers' veteran leadership, but is there going to be maybe a little bit of a, Slow start for the Jets or a little time to kind of work into it? I mean, how do you think that a new new coordinator, new quarterback, a lot of new faces? Yeah, if there's a little bit of a slow start, it's more of a credit to Buffalo in week one than a lack of continuity for the Jets. It's not only that Aaron is new there, but he also spent the great majority of the offseason there. So that, that takes away some of that newness. The second thing is, This is the same offense he's run for a great majority of his career, certainly the last few years in Green Bay. That takes a little bit of the newness away. Randall Cobb is there. So not only does he have the rapport with Randall Cobb, but Randall Cobb is teaching others the expectations on plays. So is Alan Lazard. So there's a lot of these guys that have been with Aaron, that have been in this offense. They've been with Aaron in this offense. That takes away a lot of the newness that they're going to have to trouble or have trouble with. You know, I remember when Tom went down to Tampa because it is similar. And then when Matthew Stafford went out to the Rams, Tom in those first few games was running the Bruce Arians offense and there were hiccups and there were struggles. And there was a little bit of that newness that took time. Matthew Stafford went to the Rams and Sean McVay immediately took the stuff that Matthew had run and implemented to their offense. Matthew took off immediately. So I expect this offense to kind of be firing on all cylinders quicker than um you know tom did in tampa when he went down there in 2020 looking at you know buffalo's offense and what has changed you already referenced dalton kincaid once i know you were pulling some clips from the steelers preseason game with the bills when you know kincaid was active in the middle of the field and you know we talked about here on our show last year how sometimes the offense even though it was productive for the bills throughout sometimes looked like a heavy lift that second yeah. and long, easy button answer that was Cole Beasley was no longer a part of this offense anymore. Yeah. Now it seems as though they have those easy button answers for Josh in the form of Dalton Kincaid on a second and long, for example, or even a Deontay Hardy, or even a Trent Sherfield, who has been enormously impressive it's- from the spring right through training camp. So knowing that and maybe a greater enhanced ability to work the middle of the field this year than maybe last year, could you see Josh becoming the high-efficiency quarterback again that we saw for the first time in 2020? The word you just used there is efficiency. 
Okay. And, and Chris, th- there's, there's like this overall theme. It's, it's not just central to Buffalo. It's something that we saw start to rear its head in 20, very much so in 21 and absolutely last year. And we touched on this in NFL live is these defenses and, and the, the ph- philosophy behind them and coordinators have sat there and said, they're too good. Okay. The quarterbacks are too talented. The receivers are too good for us to just constantly give them opportunities to push the ball downfield. So we're going to take these really talented players and we're going to force them to play in the style that they don't want to, nor that they, they've really been challenged to. We saw that with Patrick three years ago. We saw it with Josh two years ago, right? Efficiency, boring completions. And Josh was able to do it with Cole for, for that uh, season in, excuse me, a bug, I think 2020 or 2021. I think it's hard for me to sit here and believe that there's an offense in the NFL nowadays that is a Super Bowl caliber offense if they're incapable of being efficient because teams are going to make them play to those styles. And last year, and what I mean by efficient is when teams are lining up in these shell defenses, what do we call them, cover four or cover two or match or two man, it doesn't matter. With the elite pass rushers, if you don't have the person that will consistently get you six to eight yards of completion and in a, in a, a, a uh, kind of um, I don't have to be in the perfect play call way, I think it's hard for me to peg you as a Super Bowl offense. And I think that's what Kincaid brings to the bill. So if if that relationship and that connection is what I hope it's going to be, then this offense should be very, very, very dynamic. But it has to be that way on a consistent basis because the three-point shot will not always be there. So we've we've been talking about this all offseason. The Bills ran less 12 personnel than any team in the NFL last year. And it looks like that's probably not going to be the case this year. Mm -hmm. What does 12 personnel do to Bills opponents defensively? Yeah, so first of all, it forces you to, as a defense, how are you going to play us? in situations okay so if i put my 12 personnel one back two tight ends on the field and let's say it's first and 10 and you decide to stay in your base defense meaning three linebackers the bill should automatically be planning on 75 to 85 percent of the time throwing the football in those situations i don't care if it's a man and or zone coverage you automatically have the advantage whether we keep the the tight ends inside the numbers or we flip it and we force tight ends to play outside the numbers because they're talented enough and we bring receivers like Steph inside or Sherfield inside or Gabe Davis inside to work on linebackers okay number two if those defenses say you know what we're going to play nickel which is something Buffalo's defense does more than anybody in the NFL we're actually going to talk about that on NFL live today if you're going to play with five defensive backs on the field, that means you got a little guy. Well, then it's incumbent upon our tight ends to be good enough. I'm not saying these tight ends need to be Kittle, but good enough in the run game to where we could take advantage of that, where we could, you know, I, I remember watching teams like Minnesota do that to Buffalo's defense to take advantage of a little bit more of that efficient run game. And then the third thing I think is this. When you get teams to kind of play in that world of is it base or is it nickel, you start to, in situational football, be able to empower your quarterback at the line of scrimmage. Hey, third and four, third and five. If they line up in this, let's get to this play. And it's so many different check with me's that you could give an intelligent player like Josh to not get you out of bad plays, but to get you into ideal plays. And if those two guys can become... Uh, super, uh, I don't want to say dominant, but effective in either the pass game and or the run game in that personnel, that means you now control to the defense how you uh, will allow them to play you. Hmm. And there are, and flipping it over to the other side, Dan, there we're seeing more of a, I don't want to call it a proliferation, that might be a little too strong, but we're seeing an increase in these three safety looks from defenses sure. we know that you know Duggar was the third safety up in New England the last couple of years there are other teams doing it now I'll the Bills Buffalo. now have Taylor Rapp and there's a good chance we're going to see it from the Bills to some degree and even the Jets are talking about putting Adrian Amos on the field with the other two safeties at times so is how effective can that be as a counter to 12 personnel I think it all depends on the the safety and that third safety because here's the thing and that that's 
I understand why teams are doing it because they want a little bit more of a person who is a better in coverage than a linebacker, but also a little bit more physical than maybe some of the nickels that play right. in the NFL. Um, I, I think that the, the downside is, is if you're playing in that three safety grouping, you could be play, taking a better football player off the field than that third safety. Like I, I, I a perfect example is you guys that you just mentioned, Taylor Rapp. Good player, but Taron Johnson's a better player. He, he, but he might not be as um, physical in the run game. He's a better cover guy. He's got more experience in, in coverage, all that. So I think what's going to happen is this is where an analytics thing will come into play. Hey, if, the, if, if you're going to line up in 12 personnel on first down and the defense is in nickel, they want to run the ball 60% of the time. If the defense is in base, they want to throw the ball 75% of the time. So if we match in, in three safeties, what does that do to that percentage? You know, is that, hey, throughout the season, when Buffalo lines up in 12 personnel and they play against three safeties, they're throwing the ball 70% of the time. And I think that's going to be a vehicle that teams are going to start to use can they get you to be, and, and that's the counter for the defenses, to try to get you to do things that they have a, a, um, a little bit of an awareness of. Um, it's a smart counter if that third safety is a very good and dynamic player, but he may not be as good as the nickel in certain things. And I think that's the, you know, the third counter to, to all this. <laughs> like Baltimore, I just mentioned. Kyle Hamilton, their second-year player out of Notre Dame. Yeah. Well, Kyle is really good defending the run. So if you're playing Baltimore and you line up in your 12 personnel and Baltimore is playing in that three-safety set, maybe you lean on throwing the football a little bit more than you would have even though it's a defensive back because he's more effective against the run. So that's kind of how there's all these layers to it. Is it getting closer and closer to positionless football? where you've got five weapons on offense where you can take your split out, your X receiver, line him up in the backfield, hand it to him, and do that with all four or five of the eligible receivers. And on the, the other side, you got linebackers who predominantly now are less than 240 pounds, some of them less than 230, and they can run and cover, and then you, know, you just kind of match up with whoever, whoever, and it becomes positionless football at all away from the foot, away from the ball, all the outside guys, the defensive backs, the wide receivers, tight ends and running backs, and all the DBs, they're all positionless, where they can move around, play safety, play corner, play zone, play man, play in the run game, play not in the run game. And you're getting this this trend towards everybody being yeah. kind of the same guy. I think there's a little bit to that, Steve. I, I think the, the, the cautionary tale is like Isaiah Simmons in Arizona when he was drafted out of Clemson. He was this guy that well, he, he could play everywhere. He's a positionless player, but he's not really, at least right now in the NFL, he's he hasn't been able to show that he's necessarily good at one of those positions. So while you certainly want positional flexibility, I think that we, we have to be careful, at least in my offensive perspective, if you're push, putting a bunch of guys out there that aren't good at a certain position, I don't care where they play. I'll, I'll find them and attack them. So right. I, I think that there is an element to that. And I think it's conference based as well. I, I, I think that in, in the NFC, you do have to have defensive linemen that are run stoppers and you do have to have linebackers that can plug the hole in the run game because the two best teams or the three best teams are run centric teams. And I think in the AFC, you do need guys that are a little bit more capable of playing out in space because the quarterbacks are so dynamic. You do need yeah. a little bit more pass rush defensive tackles and run stopping defensive tackles as of right now. So uh, there, there's an element to that position list. I, I think it, I, I kind of view it as a position flexibility, a, a Derwin James for the chargers more than position list because I think you can get yourself into trouble if you, you kind of live yeah. in that world defensively. Yeah, the the problem is, yeah, you, for every J Simmons kid from Carolina or for Clemson. Uh, Clemson, there's a Micah Parsons, you know, who can who can do right. it, right? So if you can, right. of course, if you had five Micah Parsons, okay, I, you can play, right? So, <laughs> but I, I, yeah, and then now too, they're, they're asking guys at lower levels, they're asking him to be like the Josh Allens and the Cam Newtons and, and the guy, the kid from uh, the USC that's coming out. And Caleb Williams. They're getting some Great really game. good athletes. 
to play yeah. quarterback, and they're not just sticking them at tight end or running back or tight or yes. wherever. They're letting them. They're letting them take snaps, yeah. and they, they never used to do that. Yeah, and they're just saying, can you throw it a little bit? You know, yeah. If you can throw it a little bit, you know, we we believe that you can develop in that, or, um, you know, it it'll be interesting to see because with all that being said, the only guy that we've watched go on in the NFL and have a really good career when it comes to that is cam i right. think as of right now to be used in that capacity um you guys are obviously a part of you know in the last year or so it's been the bigger conversation of does josh need to run less uh not to say that josh hasn't had a great career and, and it's obviously becoming one but it'll just be um as the money continues to go up and up and up for that position how much as you get to the higher levels our team's just willing to expose those guys to hits because eventually I remember sitting with McDermott last year and saying he was around Cam and he said eventually it catches up to those guys. So yeah. um, as much as those quarterbacks are being ran, it'll be interesting to see how much that continues to be a part of it. Last one quickly, Dan, uh, knowing that you watch Oodles more tape than we do and we kind of suffer from Bill's myopia here and focus on Bill's, Bill's, Bill's. What did you pull from – preseason Jets tape that you believe no one is talking about but should be? Because Aaron Rodgers has kind of been like a solar eclipse. He's blocked out the sun with as big a story as he has been. What about the Jets in the preseason? Should people be talking about that they're not? Yeah, and I'll, I'll keep it to, to kind of Buffalo-centric for the first – first of all, the the waves of their defensive line. And, and if you had to ask me my biggest concern in this game for Buffalo, it's the – offensive line and specifically the right side and the the waves of people that they have to be able to go and rush the passer is going to be overwhelming for a lot of teams and that's going to be the biggest challenge for buffalo monday night i think the second thing is is if you don't on a relatively consistent basis get in the face of or near garrett wilson they are going to throw him the football on these little one step nows or these quickie one step slants and just get the ball in his hands. Cause he's dynamic with the ball in his hands and his catch radius is off the charts. And I think that's going to force defenses to have these conversations like, Hey, how, can, do we have a guy that can consistently one-on-one -on -one do it? Do we have to play a little bit over the top? How are we going to play pre-snap Garrett Wilson at the line of scrimmage? Because if not, he's going to have 12 catches a game. And, I, and that'll be the biggest challenge for a, a Tredavious. Um, and then I think the third thing is uh, I'm not sitting here telling everybody that this is going to be like the San Francisco 49ers offense, but the ball handling and the way that he is going to hide the football from the defense in their run or their play action game and the stuff that he does in that one and a half second frame is going to force defenses to play so much slower than they want to when he is under center. And I think that is going to, because everyone says their offensive line, I think that is going to have a profound impact on how well their offensive line is going to be able to play. Dan, thanks for the time. We look forward to talking to you next week about how this one turned out. So we'll catch up with you then. All right. Thanks for the time. Thanks guys. Enjoy it.